let me enter full screen. Do you guys see my screen? Awesome. Yes. So thank you everyone for, for being here, for willing to engage and to learn a little bit about quantum bio. Uh, thank you, the community. community. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to interacting again and more with you all. So as Jonathan said, please, please feel free to just pause me and uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. I think that's the best way that uh, we can have uh, an interesting talk. Okay, so the, the, the public, the audience is very heterogeneous. So I hope that there is going to be a little bit for everything. So I like to call myself a quantum engineer. This means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics, as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So people feel weird when I tell them that I study things that might be happening uh, inside of birds, inside of butterflies. So before I explain where I'm going with my research and with quantum bio, I really want to tell you where I come from and what's my background. So we're going to start with basic quantum mechanics. And uh, by the end of the, the hour, we will have talked about things of biological relevance, such as organismal migration, how our bodies respond to oxidative stress, how our cells interact with radiation. And I hope to have convinced you at that point that I think we can also learn with nature how to build better technologies. And that's because I am a quantum engineer who's interested in how quantum physics informs biology at very, very tiny length scales. So I'd like to, to, to introduce this talk by talking about measurements and measurements of tiny quantities. I think that humankind is obsessed with measuring things because it may be that by measuring things better, we may actually understand those things or nature better. We can think, for example, of measuring better frequencies. This um, complicated instrument that you see there is called an atomic clock and uh, it sits in the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST, in the US. And it measures, uh, it defines very well what a second is based on an atomic transition. We can think about measuring better magnetic fields so that the image of your baby is better resolved. And yes, this is the, the magnetic resonance image of a baby inside the mother's belly. And we can also, for example, think about measuring better accelerations with those tiny little accelerometers so that your gaming experience is enhanced. Those tiny little accelerometers are now ubiquitous in all our handheld devices. But the question that I ask is, what if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? Or worse, what happens if the object causing the quantity to be measured is very, very small? I'm going to argue that in this case, you need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little things. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. Uh, I won't have time to uh, explain this in detail, but there are uh, a body of mathematical arguments that prove that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is uh, improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. In my past, I worked with a, yes, there, there's a question? No, maybe not. In my past, I worked with a technological quantum sensor, and I'm going to spend some time describing this technological uh, quantum sensor that it was in fact a magnetic field sensor. So here's my promise. I'm, I promise that I will show you a single spin in diamond, in the material diamond that works as a quantum enhanced magnetic field sensor. Um, spin for those of you 
who uh, have never heard of it or have heard and forgot, um, spin is a fundamental property of objects such as uh, mass and charge. Uh, spin, however, does not have a classical counterpart, okay? Uh, things like electrons, uh, atomic, some atomic nuclei, they all have spin. And spin, the property of spin measures how well a quantum object interacts with an external magnetic field, okay? That is how the energy of objects is perturbed in the presence of magnetic fields. That's the information contained in this spin property. Engineers, physicists, and chemists usually represent spin with a uh, arrow, okay? Just uh, like the one that I'm holding here. So arrow up or arrow down, what people say spin up or spin down, just represent two different energy levels of this property called spin. That is, for example, an electron that has a spin up has a certain energy in a magnetic field. An electron that has a spin down has a different energy in a magnetic field. So um, what I'm proposing to you is that a single electronic spin in diamond can work as a uh, good quantum sensor. So let's talk a little bit about this spinning diamond that I worked with in the past. This particular spin in diamond that I worked with in the past arise in conjunction with a crystalline defect uh, in, in diamond, in the material diamond. Okay, uh, this uh, again, diamond has a lot of crystalline defects like all solids, uh, but uh, diamonds have very special crystalline defect, defects that are called color centers. Okay, and they're called color centers because uh, they absorb light, get excited, and then they get de excited by emitting uh, light, which is called fluorescence. And uh, color centers are the crystalline defects responsible for the colors of those nice diamonds that you see there at the end of, uh, at the bottom of the slide. Okay. The particular color center that uh, makes a, a, quantum a quantum sensor is a, a crystalline defect called nitrogen vacancy center. It arises naturally, but it can also be engineered. And it shows up when a vacancy that is a missing diamond atom, a missing carbon atom in the diamond lattice, right, uh, sits nearby to a nitrogen that is the most commonly found substitutional impurity in the lattice of carbon that makes diamonds. When those two things come together, the vacancy and the nitrogen, there's like a mess of electronic interaction there, right? The vacancy leaves nearby electrons unpaired. The nitrogen has an extra uh, electron nearby. There might be uh, charges flowing in and out, but something very interesting happens when you calculate the quantum mechanical energy levels of this messy compound. When you calculate the quantum mechanical energy levels of of, of the nitrogen, the vacancy, the things around, those energy levels look like the energy levels of a single electronic spin. So basically, and that's very convenient, you can look at this color center, this crystalline defect, and interpret it as a single electronic spin. And there is a question in the, in the, in the, in the chat, uh, what makes the carbon move go missing in diamonds? So, um, uh, first of all, uh, next time, just feel free to, 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 to like unmute yourselves and, and ask. Uh, first of all, all solids uh, have defects, right? All real life uh, solids, they, they have missing atoms, uh, planes of atoms that don't really match. Uh, that is uh, to be expected. But there are, and, and like one of those defects is a point defect called a vacancy that is a missing carbon, a missing atom from 
the solid state lattice. Some things can make, for example, those missing atoms, this, these vacancy move around. For example, if you heat up uh, the material very much, the vacancies, they move uh, towards the place that, that minimizes the total energy of the material. And actually that is one way that people manufacture those nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. So people bombard diamond with nitrogen, that is they insert nitrogen there, and then there are naturally occurring vacancies so that they heat up the, 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 the temperature of the diamond so that the, let, the, the vacancy will migrate. And in order to, to lower their energy, many times it ends up close to a nitrogen, forming this crystal, this crystal defect called the nitrogen vacancy center, which, as I was saying, uh, can be thought of as a single electronic spin. If there are no further questions, I would just like to tell you a little bit what we use to find those defects in the lab and, and actually start playing with them. It's actually very simple. At room temperature, getting like a crappy diamond sample and actually the very first diamond sample that I worked with was like a reject from a jeweler. So you put the diamond sample on top of a moving stage and you move it around at the same time that you shine a laser onto this diamond. It actually does not need to be a laser, but it, it's much more effective and easier to work with lasers in the lab. What happens is that the end, the, this, this uh, uh, nitrogen vacancy center is a color center. That is, it absorbs light, gets excited, and then it emits light back. So as we are scanning the, the, the diamond around, uh, if we hit one of those defects, the defect is going to get excited, uh, absorb the light, get excited, and then emit light. And this light we can collect and make images of where we find those colors, those centers in the diamond. And this is what it looks like at increasing zooms, okay? So at the, the, the rightmost plot there, you see a blob, okay? Uh, this is a very zoomed uh, signal, uh, like it's a fluorescent signal, and it's sort of very interesting because it's almost incredible. But what you're looking at right there is that the fluorescence emitted by a single emitter by an effective single electronic spin. So the um, defect itself is... Uh, not atomically uh, small, right? There are just some atoms, but the, the blob that you see there is much bigger because uh, there's something that's called a, a, a diffraction limit. That is, um, there are optical limits at the precision that you can get. So even though the defect is tiny, you see this big blob. And uh, uh, I, I forgot your name, but you had your 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 um, Hadi. No, oh, Hadi. Yes, yes tell yes. me. Yeah, I have a question about the temperature of the this uh, experiment. Do they need yes. to be low temperature or room no. temperature? No, no, very important. This uh, so people do make experiments with this uh, spin at low temperatures, but no, the, this spin and i'm going to show you works as a quantum sensor at room temperature everything that i'm describing here is at room temperature which is going to give us a lot of advantages excellent thank you cool Ioannis, uh, we can engineer a lattice of nitrogen centers at our will like a mask or are they randomly created actually actually now that's uh, a very active um, uh, research uh, a topic. There are people. I don't think I have. I have the picture in this in this slide deck. But there are uh, There are people like material scientists who are actually creating, say, uh, arrays of those nitrogen vacancy centers at will. So there, it's 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 now 
an engineering problem and no longer a, a basic science problem. But, but yes, people are creating those wherever they uh, want nowadays. But even in crappy diamonds with no preparation at all, they occur, as you can see in this video picture here, sort of randomly. And there's someone with a, with a raised hand, and I don't know, Giancarlos. Yeah, Giancarlo. Um, Tell me. Yeah, so with the, with the color sensors, does the amount of color sensors in the diamond affect how sensitive it is? And if so, like, does it affect it at all? Um, and if so, how can you engineer the amount of color sensors in a diamond? So um, I am not going to, to explain this in this in this talk, but there are two different ways of using those color centers as quantum sensors. You can use one single color center, like one blob like this as a quantum center, uh, as a quantum sensor, okay? And this has some advantages, but there are also people who are using ensembles of uh, nitrogen vacancy centers, and they use this ensemble as a quantum sensor. And that has other advantages, right? For example, uh, using uh, a lot of NV centers, you have like signals coming from a lot of, of sensors. So you have more sort of signal, but you lose in spatial resolution, right? Because your information comes from, from many, many uh, centers, not a single one. So, so people use those two. Uh, what I'm going to describe is how to use one single uh, nitrogen vacancy center as a quantum sensor. Okay. Hadi, that's, yes. That's different. Yeah, uh, right. Yes, I have a question about the uh, layers that, for example, is uh, necessary to have a, as a bulk or, for example, two layer, one layer. Does it help the efficiency of the measurement? Um, what do you mean the efficiency of the measurement? Uh, for example, um, uh, sensitivity, for instance. So uh, the sensitivity of uh, this color center as a quantum sensor depends on many factors, right? For example, it depends, for reasons that I won't go into, on how much light you can collect out of it the more light, the more information you're going to have in shorter, in a shorter time, right? So if you want more light to, to be able to collect more light, you want to, to work with nitrogen vacancy centers that are close to the surface of your diamond slab, right? For example, because then it, you have like a better chance of collecting this light before it gets scattered and, and things like this. But on the other hand, uh, people actually see that if you work with super shallow uh, nitrogen vacancy center defects, then there are other interactions that screw up with the way that this thing works. So it's it's all like a, a trade-off. Uh, in, in simple, regular vanilla experiments like the ones that I did, we would use um, uh, sensors that were about uh, one micro micron below the surface of uh, this lab. I see. Thank you. So I hope that right now you're already awed by the fact that we have, we can see a signature of one single spin by looking at like a light blob, fluorescence, a light blob in our computer. But actually it gets even better uh, for reasons that I won't have time to explain. Again, this uh, defect has something that people in the quantum business call quantum state dependent fluorescence intensity. This means that if the uh, spin, the electronic spin is say up, this blob that you see there is going to emit light uh, at, a, at a certain intensity. And if the spin is down, this blob is going to emit light at a different intensity. So that just by looking at how intense that stuff is emitting light, you can have information about the quantum state of the electronic spin, which is again, it's amazing, right? It's super 
nice. Uh, Ioannis asks, each center emits a single photon. Yes, at every particular, at, at every single point in time, each, each center emits one single photon. It is a single photon emitter at all times. Uh, even if we shine a laser beam on the center, we are sort of shining a laser beam on the center, right? But at any given time, this, uh, uh, this material only absorbs one photon at a time and, and, and like emits one, one photon at a time. Like if, if it's, you can think of it like in two states, right? If you are in a state, you see a, a photon, you get excited. If there are more photons here, coming, there's nothing to get excited. So in the end, uh, you get only emission of one photon per unit of time. But I promised that I would make it a, a very sensitive magnetometer. And here's how it works. Uh, can you, uh, um, Jayaram, I, I can talk to you more a little bit uh, later. I am uh, just showing how you can put a single spinning diamond to work as a uh, quantum enhanced magnetometer. So, and here's how this works. I am drawing here two different energy levels. So in this uh, y axis here, it's the spin energy, okay? And zero and one signify, uh, it, it's just another name that I'm giving for spin up and spin down. And in the case of this uh, nitrogen vacancy center, the difference in uh, energy between up and down states is in the microwave. It's about three gigahertz of energy difference. Okay. It turns out that uh, the state that I put there uh, as zero, it's insensitive to magnetic fields. That is, if it's immersed in a magnetic field, it really doesn't care. Whereas the state that I that I put there as one, it is sensitive to magnetic fields. That is, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, it will get promoted in energy by a tiny amount that I call delta. And uh, delta, uh, some of you might have seen this via something called Zeeman interaction or Zeeman energy is directly proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field that it sees. And I'm going to pause because I'm going to make a very important statement that does not usually get made, okay? So hear up because this is important. The fact is that the problem of measuring a magnetic field is mapped onto the problem of being able to measure a detuning, a mismatch delta from a known energy difference. So in the absence of magnetic fields, the difference in energy between zero and one is about three gigahertz. In the presence of a magnetic field, this energy difference changes. If one can measure this energy shift, because the energy shift is proportional to the magnetic field, we can have information on the magnetic field, okay? And uh, very luckily for all of us, engineers and physicists have known how to measure mismatches, the tunings delta from resonances, from energy differences for many, many decades. And actually, this is how almost all modalities of quantum sensing works. We have information about, uh, about a quantity, say magnetic field here, because there is a, an energy difference that changes in the presence of that quantity. We can do the same for electric fields, for temperature, right? So almost all quantum sensing modalities uh, work because the experimentalist knows how to measure detunings from energy differences. And this is a very important point. But there's a catch. And the catch is that this very nice way of measuring magnetic fields 
is only helpful while the spin is well described by the laws of quantum mechanics. Everything that starts quantum dies classical, and that's why we live in a classical world. So uh, when a spin, electron spin stops being well described by the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, if you have taken quantum mechanics before, what I mean is that uh, after there is no phase coherence between a superposition of the two spin states, the spin uh, is, uh, is, it doesn't need to be uh, well described, described by quantum mechanics, the spin behaves as a tiny magnet, okay? So, uh, and, and the time that it takes for this spin to lose its quantumness, again, at room temperature in the messy diamond sample is, and, and this for like naturally occurring samples is about two microseconds. That's the time that it takes for this spin not to be useful anymore as a, uh, uh, as a quantum sensor, okay? The only useful information that we're going to be able to, 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 to get from this spin, like if we don't do anything, is going to be about two microseconds. So it, it actually becomes a, a signal processing uh, problem, if you will. Imagine that you can take a signal from this sensor, right? Some, something that you want to read out as a function of time. The longer you can take the signal before it dies out, when you Fourier transform it, the better your resolution in the spectrum. So here is sort of the same thing. What we want to do with the spin is sort of kick it in order to try to extend its quantumness, okay? Even if its natural quantumness is only about two microseconds. And actually for a quantumness to last for two microseconds at room temperature, this is already really, really extraordinary, but we want better. And uh, it turns out that uh, people have known again for many decades that uh, for, uh, spins and for other quantum objects made of matter that we can uh, actually extend the quantumness of those uh, quantum objects by kicking them with electromagnetic radiation of particular frequencies and uh, particular frequencies and, uh, and, and and particular shapes right and this is from a field uh, that's called nuclear magnetic resonance. So you can think of it like a, uh, you have a, a swing, right? You have a kid on a swing and um, the, the idea is to keep the, the swing oscillating, uh, to not let the, the swing stop. So if you give kicks to the swing at particular times, you keep it going. So here it's the same. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, one way that we can apply light or electromagnetic fields, in this case, is going to be light at the microwave uh, frequency in order to get this spin kicked so that we can play with it as a quantum sensor for long. So before that, before I get to my the most technical slide in this whole presentation, I just want you not to lose this picture of mind. What we want is to have a tiny little sensor that can sense tiny little magnetic field that can come very close to a sample and that can sense tiny little magnetic fields produced by a couple of atoms or a couple of electrons in a sample. So that is the big picture here. Um, Johannes, I do not understand your question. Oh, no, it's it's not really a metastable state to increase the time. It's it's rather trying to increase, trying to keep the quantumness going. We, we can talk about that a little bit later, but it's, it's I see what you're saying. It's different. Um, I, uh, Jayaram, I do not understand these words. I'm actually in middle school. T tell me, Tell me, Jair, what don't you understand? 
Um, so actually some of the, um, so some of the words like, like, um, so, 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 okay, I understand some of the words, but it's like not like matching up, like not really getting to me. Yes. Tell me, tell me, for example, like, for, like pretty much like most of it, like most of it. Okay. Um, so, um, basically the idea is is that we have a quantum object okay uh, in in this case we have a electron inside the material diamond and this electron has a quantum property that is called spin that is yeah, uh, it, like a, a property of yeah, yeah, matter yeah, as much as charge spin. yes awesome okay and uh, the idea is that we can put this spin to work as a magnetic field sensor. Like, like it's prop, like it's a property, but how do you make it work as a sen magnetic sensor? So imagine that you want to measure a magnetic field, right? You yeah. want, to, you put this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this material, the diamond into inside a box and you want to measure the magnetic field inside this box, right? Yeah. The, idea, the idea is that um, one of the two spin states of, of, of the electron doesn't care about the magnetic field, okay? Whereas the other energy state is perturbed by the field. It, it gets changed, okay? Oh, for, for example, yeah. You can have like, uh, uh, think about the zero state, I say zero volts in an yeah, oscilloscope. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually, the, yeah, yeah, now I understand. Cool, awesome. And the idea is that the larger the magnetic field, the larger the perturbation of the energy of one of the spin states, right? So that by measuring, uh, you measure the magnetic field because the experimentalist knows how to measure this the shift in energy that we see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah now I get it. Awesome. And that, now there's Thank a question: you. like, what's the lower magnetic field value? It depends. I'm going to show you that in, 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 it depends, and people are always pushing the limit. It depends on on many things, how good your, your diamond is. I'm going to show you uh, a measurement that we took and what we could get is like one tenth of the magnetic field of the earth, which is really, really tiny. The magnetic field of the earth is smaller than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your, to your face. So at least one tenth of the magnetic field of the earth we can, we can measure. So um, I'm going to show you like the most complicated slide. Don't worry. All I want you is to remember this big picture here. Tiny sensor able to measure tiny quantities. Okay. This is the slide where I show you an example of uh, what we do in the lab. Okay. So uh, I told you in the past slide that uh, many times we want to extend the quantumness of this spin. And we do so by kicking it with light at, uh, at, 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 in, in, in particular ways, like, like you kick a swing, okay? Um, this designing those kicks, uh, started in a field called nuclear magnetic resonance. It's not important, right? But in the plot to the right there, I write in nuclear magnetic resonance jargon what those kicks look like. I'm not expecting you to read, but what it means is that I am, uh, in order to get the spin going, Right. What I do is I apply a continuous microwave. So I have a microwave cable close to, to a microwave antenna that the that the spin that the close to the diamond so that the spin is affected by it. 
I apply a constant microwave at the origin at a frequency which is the original energy difference between the spin states. And at particular intervals, I switch just the phase of the pulse. Okay, so so. Uh, 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 um, waves, they have phases, right? They have amplitudes, they have a frequency. So here I'm switching uh, the phase, okay? It's not really important. And this has a name for those of you who have seen uh, quantum mechanics, this is called the rotary echo. Not important. What's important is that if you then obtain the signal emitted by this nitrogen vacancy center. And signal here is just fluorescence intensity. If you remember, uh, the fluorescence intensity changes as a function of the state of the spin. So this signal here is sort of going to show us where, what's the quantum state of the spin. So for example, at the top of this signal here, we have the spin state at say up. At the very bottom of the signal, we have the spin state at down. And everything in between, every value in between the, 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 the peaks means that the spin is in a superposition of up and down. Okay, so this is what the signal looks like. It's, it's a fluorescence intensity as a function of the time during which we keep giving on kicks to this spin. And as you see, the signal is sort of going down, right? At, at some point, it will become a flat line and then it's going to cease to, to convey information. Uh, and Jairam asks, what's a nitrogen vacancy center? Um, it, it, the nitrogen vacancy center uh, is where this electric spin, electronic spin lives. Go back to, to, to the YouTube version so that you can see this. Uh, it's, it's the nitrogen vacancy center is actually the crystalline defect in diamond that where, where there is this single spin. It's an, an atomic defect, okay? So, but what, what do we do now? We have the signal, how do we get Remember, we want to kick the spin so that it works as a quantum sensor for longer, but ultimately we want to measure magnetic fields, right? So uh, what you can do is you can use theory. For those of you in the audience who are experts, there's something called average Hamiltonian theory, not important at all, but one can model how the signal depends on this uh, delta that if you remember is like this shift in energy that one of the spin states sends few as a function of magnetic fields. And if we have information on Delta, we have information on the magnetic field. So we know how this signal depends on the magnetic field because we know how the signal depends on Delta. And just for you to understand, if you now Fourier transform this signal, if you look at it at the frequency domain, if you look at the frequency content of the signal, you get uh, a curve that looks like this, this plot here. It doesn't really matter. It's spectrum uh, in the y axis is just arbitrary intensity. In the x axis is a function of the frequency. And there's a particular way of reading those peaks. But to cut a long story short, uh, in this signal that you see there, there are mainly three different deltas, three different tunings that we can measure, the smallest of which uh, is equivalent to a magnetic field, which is one tenth of the magnetic field of the Earth. So this is how we measure, how we use this single spin as a quantum enhanced magnetic field sensor. I'm going to, to, to go back here because that slide was not important. What's important is this big picture here. You have a tiny little sensor 
that works at room temperature under messy conditions, right? And that can sense tiny little things, okay? And with that, I have just shown you a quantum sensor that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. That's the very first quantum sensor that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. That's the very first one that you're going to see today because now I'm going to talk about biological quantum sensors that are also quantum, that also work at room temperature and also work in noisy environments. So before we shift gears, it's going to be shorter, the second part. What are your questions? Um, so, so, so you're talking about like something about kicks, like so, 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 so like um, so is the kick like, like, like in like, not, not, not in like a general way, but but in like a science way, like um, so, so is the kick like represented by like, um, like, like, like is another particle hitting like a photon, like hitting the um, hi um, hitting the particle, uh, uh. You are right. This analogy is not uh, super good because it, it's not the, the the physical kick that uh, matters there. It's not the the photon kick that matters there. What matters is that uh, with light, with electromagnetic radiation, in this case with microwaves, we can actually correct for noise. Okay, um, it's it's like. Uh, I use the kick analogy because like the, the swing analogy, because we all know that uh, like if we if we push the swing at particular times, it, it continues to swing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, with this with this uh, with this spin, it's sort of the same thing. The spin uh, is a quantum object and everything that starts quantum loses its quantumness over time. Right, and that's that's why everything around us is 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 classical because like spins start interacting in a disorderly way with like other spins, with other electrons, with other atoms, and all this uh, this mess right pushes the spin to a uh, uh, classical state. This is also why uh, quantum computers are not like. A reality nowadays. They they all they all exist, but they 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 exist for a very short time, right? Because all yes. So 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 what you're talking like about is quantum un well quantum unhealing. Um, not necessarily quantum unhealing, but all modalities of quantum computer, right? Uh, the quantum computers they all have. A finite life. That's why, like, in the same way that people uh, want to do, uh, so so the, the quantum computers they're not perfect because there's noise, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's why we need to do error correction, right? And like doing error correction in some way, it's sort of similar to what we're trying to do here. It's trying okay. to correct. The, the spin so that so correct the quantum object so that it can live longer as a quantum object. Okay, got it. Thank you. Cool. Giancarlo. Uh, yeah, so I imagine that control sensors are transient. Um, I also imagine that control sensors are not something endemic of diamonds, I believe, because. It I'm imagining, I'm not a material scientist, but I am imagining that um, these vacancy centers exist in all the materials. Um, so depending, what, what properties of material, of the materials, um, like my question is to what extent can you uh, elongate the quantum mass um, of, with different materials, um, like how well can you control that? Because I imagine that since this is going to be transient, like to get a signal at all, we're going to have to elongate it. Like in, in say in a biological environment, we're going to have to elongate the signal quite significantly. Um, so I'm wondering. So, 
uh, first part of your question uh, in many materials there are uh, other uh, crystalline defects that also give rise to more or less well behaved spins right to effective spins so there even in diamond there are many other uh, crystalline defects there is like a silicon carbon center tin vacancy centers okay and each one of those has a particularity right one doesn't work at room temperature the other one is good for that not good for that so and again there are people whose job is to mine and simulate materials with defects to know which ones give rise to, to good quantum sensors and under which uh, uh, capacities right. your um, second question was like yeah we want those the quantumness to be very long right and you're already stipulating like well in biological materials right like maybe spins in biological materials they they do not live long at all this is right but let me give another view from a quantum sensing perspective right so uh, you are right that the longer you can acquire the signal the more refined you're going to be able to, to measure quantities right because when you Fourier transform you get a better detail but even spins which are quantum for a very short time you can still acquire a signal before it dies and when you Fourier transform it, you still, you're still sensitive to something, but you're sensitive to much larger, to much larger shifts in energy, right? So it's it's all a trade-off. If, for example, for a certain process, you only need to sense a very large shift in magnetic field, you don't need a very long-lived quantum sensor. So on the other hand, if for a certain process, you need to be able to sense very small variations of a quantity of magnetic field, then you need a quantum sensor that lives longer. What I'm going to argue biologically is that, well, maybe, you know, uh, you just need to live for as long as you need to live to be quantum for. Thank you. That's... Thank you. That's the idea. Who? Taurian. Taurian, am I pronouncing your name correctly? It's actually pronounced Turin, but it's fine. Turin, Turin, Turin. Yep. Tell me, Turin. Yeah, so um, when you say quantumness, right? Like, what exactly, yep. um, what quantum effect are you talking about? Like, are you talking about superposition, entanglement? Yes. Um, I okay. am, uh, I'm, at the very basis, I'm, like, for this case, I am talking about uh, for how long uh, the superposition lives, right? For how long you have a stable phase difference between zero and one. Got it. Between so the two states. About, so pretty much you're talking about decoherence time, right? Yes, I'm, I'm talking about decoherence time. Yes. Just out of curiosity, how long is that decoherence time? In uh, So T2 star in crappy diamond is about two microseconds. And now people at room temperature. Now people are uh, improving the materials and, and doing things like this so that uh, there's the coherence time in, 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 in the diamond that they produce is already much longer. But, but again, already two microseconds is extremely, extremely long for a quantum object to live at room temperature, right? So mm -hmm. even, even two microseconds is already like extraordinary if you compare with other quantum technologies that need to be cooled down, right? you would never have a superconducting qubit, well, superconducting qubit, no, but you would never have like other type of qubits at room temperature working as, with coherence times as long as a microsecond. Yeah, usually, it's kind of usually. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, um, yes. Just also out of curiosity, so I remember like also reading an article on, you know, you know quantum biology, but mainly in, you know, like the quantum brain aspect, you know, like quantum events happening in the human brain. Right, and I'm, I forgot the researcher that would actually wrote this article, but I remember he was talking about, you know, pretty much a molecule that's, you know, between the synapses, you know, between the neurons that, you know, 
pretty much have a quantum effect to them, right? And, you know, the decoherence time is drastically longer. So, like, you know, by any chance, do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. Um, the researcher that you're talking about is probably someone called Matthew Fisher. Yep. Uh, uh, we in our group have, so uh, people, this is just a parenthesis. So Matthew Fisher has a spin, a, a nuclear spin. Uh, it's all theoretical, okay? There is no exper experiments on, on that in a particular molecule. And he claims that the coherence times is like days. Right? Uh, in his models, he assumes a certain symmetry of the molecule uh, that gives rise to these extremely long coherence times. And we have just proved in a paper that the molecule uh, does not assume in real life that very symmetric arrangement. And now we're working on a second paper to see what will the consequence be on those coherence times. So um, me and my collaborators, we're not very sure that that the, the thing is as long lived as he thought. But but we, we should talk more. Let me go to, to Kai. Kai? Hi. Yes. Yes. I have a question. Um so we are talking about extending the quantumness of this yes. uh um atom or molecule. I'm sorry I don't know the terminology. What is the purpose of extending this? What what will we gain from extending the quantumness? We gain the fact that we can obtain quantum information about the magnetic field for longer and longer. The moment that the quantumness ends, the signal goes to zero, right? That is, you stop getting any information. So you can only get useful quantum information out of your spin while th there is th there's quantumness, right? As the spin loses its, its, this is the jargon, loses its coherence, loses its quantumness, uh, you can no longer obtain useful information. Basically what happens experimentally is that your signal just goes to, to a flat line. So it's like, if you're using a cell phone, the quantumness is like the cell phone and you can talk and stuff. But as soon as it goes away, you're like the cell phone goes off or something like that. So um, uh, here it's uh, the sensor is a very particular spin, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That, that uh, at this point, that has nothing to do with the, with the cell phone. Uh, like the, the cell phone is, uh, I'm not saying that we are sensing magnetic fields or doing anything. See, here, I'm telling you that there is this particular electronic spin, this particular electron, effective electron in diamond that is a magnetic field sensor. What I'm going to argue in the next slides is that um, there are, spins in biological systems, such as in, in particular proteins in birds that are responsive, responsive to magnetic fields in a very similar way that this spin in diamond is responsive to magnetic fields. And Thank this so is going to get very cool. So uh, I, I, I've seen that the, the uh, workshop has been extended by 15 minutes. So let me talk about what I really want to talk about to all of you. So before in my career, I was used to dealing with those sensors there, like technological sensors, like uh, this magnetic sensor. But, but at some point I realized that nature many times produced sensors that overperformed humankind made sensors in crazy, crazy ways. Right now, I would like to talk to you about a natural magnetic sensor that I'm going to argue is quantum enhanced. Uh, this is, so we're finally at the point where I want to be. <laughs> less than, than 10 minutes remaining, but we're, we're going to get there. So, but before we talk about biology at the nanoscale, we need to talk about 
uh, like the chemistry, right? Because the chemist, so biology is under, so physics underlies chemistry that underlies uh, biology. So let's go one level down, let's go talk about the chemistry. So it's had, it has been known for many decades, uh, like in basic chemistry, in chemistry that you do in the lab, that magnetic fields can alter the final products of a class of chemical reactions that are spin sensitive. So what happens is that there are some chemical reactions that uh, they're happening, right? Something is happening. And at some point there is an electron spin and depending if the spin is up or down, the chemical reaction continues through different pathways. At some point at that particular crossroads, if the spin is up, the chemical reaction continues through one branch. And if the spin is down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the final products of those two branches are different, okay? So a magnetic field that alters this spin alters the probability that this path is taken or that this path is taken. So it's in this sense, the magnetic fields can actually change the fate, the macroscopic fate of chemical reactions. So this is known from basic chemistry. There is no, no issue in that. This has been demonstrated at room temperature in solution, the gas phase in the solid phase and for magnetic fields as small as the magnetic field of the earth, which as we said, is very, very tiny. So at some point uh, in the early 80s, some very brave theoretical biophysicists proposed something that was crazy at the time. So here's what they proposed. Here's what they hypothesized. They said, well, were the same mechanism of magnetic fields altering spin-dependent chemical reactions, were the same mechanism active in organisms organisms could sense magnetic fields to the extent that they could sense different physiological concentrations of products coming from the different branches of these chemical reactions. At this point, this was completely out of like, woo, it was like, woo, like string theory, right? But actually the people started uh, looking into, into that, Right, and uh, people started really seriously hypothesizing, and it's known, for example, without any doubt, that birds, when they migrate, birds, butterflies, turtles, when they migrate, they use the magnetic field of the Earth at least as a partial cue. Okay, again, magnetic field of the Earth is extremely small. So, how on Earth are they doing this? Because they are. So the idea was that, well, imagine, for example, in the eye of the bird, if there were a spin dependent chemical reaction that, for example, whose products would modulate the light sensitivity of the birds, for example. If this were so, the birds like moving the head or, or looking one way or the other, they would actually see magnetic field lines right as the picture there so that you could see where where you are or or not so that they could orient whereas this has not been proven yet what uh, has been found and it's uh, very actively researched is the fact that actually in the bird's eye there is a protein uh, called cryptochrome that also uh, so, uh, the, the, the cryptochrome that sustains spin dependent chemical reactions. Okay, this uh, cryptochrome molecule, um, it's not only birds that have, like birds have it, uh, butterflies have it in their antennas and actually we have it in all our cells because it's also responsible for a circadian rhythm, circadian clock regulation functions when you when you uh, when you uh, if, if you travel and you go to another time zone and you are jet lagged 
sometimes people say that you should look at, and this is not voodoo, that, that, that's real. People, you, you should look at like blue light. Uh, and this is because a cryptochrome, for example, absorbs blue light, okay? And this helps you like regulate your circadian rhythm, okay? And it's, it's very interesting because uh, cryptochrome, this protein, um, is present throughout the tree of life. And now all those organisms there express cryptochromes and many of those organisms there uh, have been shown to, to have magnetic field sensing properties that to some extent depend on cryptochrome, okay? And this is very, very crazy. And right now, I think it's sort of clear within the community that the evidence that cryptochrome is serving as a mediator, at least for, for sensing magnetic fields, this evidence is really, really solid, but unfortunately at very disconnected land scales, okay? So uh, on the left panel there in the slide, there is, that, there is evidence showing that cryptochrome actually behaves as a magnetic field quantum sensor, pretty much like the spin in diamond. For example, uh, again, I said that cryptochromes absorb blue light, they absorb light, they get excited, and then they emit light again. In the left top plot that you see there, you see the fluorescence emitted by this molecule in solution, cryptochrome, as a function of the time, during which you, uh, you shine a laser, you, sh you shine blue light onto it. The first thing that you see is that the intensity of the fluorescence is going down. This, you're basically killing the protein with the, with the light, you're photo damaging the protein. This is called uh, bleaching, it's, it's, it's okay, it's, it's not a problem. But as the researchers post a magnetic field on and off, the researchers saw a following of the fluorescence levels that you can see in the inset following the magnetic field profile. This is in direct analogy to what you saw with the spinning diamond. Remember, just by looking at how strongly the blob was emitting light, you could infer whether the spin was up or down. Here, it's the same thing. Just by looking at how strongly the molecules are emitting light, you can infer whether the chemical reaction went through the up pathway or the down pathway. And there's also uh, other partial e experimental evidence that says that cryptochrome maintains its quantumness at room temperature for about one microsecond. Again, at the same order of magnitude as naturally occurring diamond. All of this is very cool, right? But unfortunately, the next level of evidence, as you can see in the right uh, place there, is like we go from molecules to whole birds, whole flies, right? You can, you can put birds in cage and then uh, during migration season and see which side they want to go out of the cage. And then you can put magnetic fields outside and you can alter the direction that the birds want to, to go out. You can train flies to uh, find food via the presence of a magnetic field. Flies can be trained. And then the researchers train the flies. In, uh, then they uh, genetically modified the flies to remove the cryptochrome gene. And then the flies no longer could find food if a magnetic field was applied. And then in the next experiments, the, the researchers put back human cryptochrome inside the flies and the flies were back to finding to finding the food in the presence of a magnetic field. All this is, most of it is consistent with the spin uh, mechanism, with the quantum, biological quantum sensing, but it's really hard to say, well, the bird is quantum because there's a, there's a, right? It's too complicated to go from bird to quantum. And this is exactly what we are doing in our lab. We're just starting, right? We want to bridge those two land scales. We want to uh, start doing quantum inspired experiments in living systems, but at smaller land scales, right? What we want to do is to start looking at those proteins, for example, cryptochrome inside single cells, 
and 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 see what uh, what happens. We want to correlate what happens at the spin level by uh, capturing the light, which is the spin signature and correlate that with other cellular parameters that people usually look at when they're doing microscopy. So what we are building are glorified microscopes with coils. The coils is to produce magnetic fields to play with the spins and we need the microscope to sort of observe the cellular parameters, okay? And uh, my, all my work and my talk in general would be much poorer if all those things were only interesting birds, right? It turns out that spin dependent phenomena, it appears that it's, again, at, at those larger land scales, right? There, there's evidence that other relevant uh, physiological processes might be spin dependent. So there's, um, there's evidence that is consistent with it being dependent on spins. For example, the production, how, how much reactive oxygen species, you know, if you have too much of reactive oxygen species, um, it's not good for your body. And that's why some people take antioxidants, right? The production of reactive oxygen species uh, seem to depend on magnetic fields in a way that is that is consistent with it being dependent on spins. Growth of uh, stem cells in planaria, which is a flat worm, also depends on uh, uh, magnetic fields in a way that looks like uh, it depends like in a spin consistent fashion. Uh, how much DNA repair is, is, is done also seems to depend on magnetic fields in a spin dependent, in a way that, that, that is consistent with the spin hypothesis, right? So it, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really crazy, uh, right? What those, what those things are. For example, right? Um, I have a friend and he's a physicist, a hardcore experimental physicist. He does precision measurements with neutrons, whatever, but his uh, specialty is building hypomagnetic ca cages. It's like cages where inside there's like almost no magnetic field. So magnetic field of the earth is like 50 microtesla. Inside his, his cages, there's like one nanotesla of residual field. He started hearing about those things with magnetic fields and what he did, again, physicist, but this has been reproduced in two labs now. He put um, tadpoles to grow for two days inside his hypomagnetic chambers. I don't think I have the picture here in this, in this, uh, in, in this, um, in these slides. He put tadpoles to grow inside his chamber for two days, one only under the one nanotesla residual field and the other set to grow under uh, in the hypomagnetic chamber with an internal magnetic field that mimicked the magnetic field of the Earth. The tadpoles that grown under the mimicked magnetic field of the Earth were normal, but the tadpoles grown in the absence, like with just the residual nanotesla field, 30% of those were macroscopically deformed. The tadpoles were freaking macroscopically deformed, right? 30%. Again, this does not prove that the things depend on spin, but given the tiny magnitudes of the fields involved and the fact that only by taking out a tiny magnetic field, things go wrong, this is an indication that spin physics might be going on. And that's why we want to study this like really with, with with high tech, right? What we want to do is a quantum sensing experiment in vivo. And, and again, there's all types of other things, right? Like Mars, what the freaking is the magnetic field of Mars? Can we grow lettuce on Mars? Can we reproduce on Mars, right? Those questions, they might be super important for the time being, right? So the, the, the uh, goal of my group is to see whether quantum physics can be either established or refuted. It's also important, right? That we, that we put error bounds and, and, and or refuted to account for 
relevant physiological phenomena, right? And we want to know if uh, quantum physics or spin physics in particular can be manipulated to like technological and therapeutic advantage. Therapeutically, because you can think about, you know, applying magnetic fields to, to drive chemical reactions or like to, to alter the course of, of the disease. Again, this is not going to happen within five years. This is going to happen like within 50 years, right? But I think it might be possible to non-invasively apply those magnetic fields to, to alter in a very particular way uh, uh, physiological processes, and also like for technology purposes, right? If nature is using quantum mechanics, it, it knows darn well how to deal with noise, right? Because in this case, it would be like quantum mechanics at room temperature. So I'm not saying let's replace Google's beautiful quantum computer with a molecule, but are there strategies used by nature that we can adapt and, and apply on top of the existing quantum architecture of quantum computers, right? Um, Tareen, yes, question. Yeah, so I actually have two questions, right? So, yes. So this 100% means that evolution evolved this way, right? We evolved using quantum effects. So we do not know, we do not know. Um, I, if we have um, simulations, that's really crazy, okay? Um, we have simulations on, oh, there was, um, Jairam asked if we, if we also do the experiments. Yes, I am primarily an experimentalist, so we're building the experiments, but I also do like simple simulations. We have theory collaborators that do much better simulations, but I also do like crappy, but useful simulations. So. Sorry, we have simulations that if you plot here the magnetosensitivity, how sensitive the cryptochrome is to magnetic fields as a function of magnetic field strength, okay? What you see, again, simulation, I'm dying to take this curve experimentally, which hasn't been taken. What you see is that the magnetosensitivity goes up and down. First of all, at like 10 times the magnetic field of the earth, the sen magnetosensitivity is very much down. That is, this is not a high field effect. That is, if you apply a very high field, it doesn't help, help the, the molecule being sensitive, right? It doesn't help those independent phenomena. But the other very interesting thing is that in this curve that goes up and down, it peaks very close to the magnetic field of the earth, which might be a coincidence or it might be a evolutionary pressure. We cannot do this, decide this in our group, but there are people who do something called directed evolution of proteins. And we think those people could help us verify if it's a coincidence or not. Got it. Also like, so I guess my second question, right? By the way, that's really, really cool, right? It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. But my second question was, okay, so let's just, let's say hypothetically, you know, we actually are, you know, like, you know, well, all of us were quantum mechanical apparatuses, right? All of us, right? But, you know, if we wanted to simulate, like, you know, a biological animal, right? That means that we cannot do it on classical computers, right? If this was true. Well, we already can't, right? Because there are so many classical moving pieces that it, it wouldn't be feasible, right? I mean, like, that, that's why we have chaotic things. We cannot... That's a bad example, but I mean, it, it, even if we, we weren't, it, it, even if there is no quantumness in us, we still cannot simulate very big organisms in any case, right? Because there are just too, too many degrees of freedom to be, to be accounted yeah. by any computer, no? Yep, I agree. Um, I just wanted to ask, right? So like, you know, if you wanted to simulate some of these effects, like, well, something that Feynman had said was, you know, if you want to simulate anything that is, you know, that anything that's, you know, quantum related or anything that's in a real world, you have to do it on a quantum computer. So does this mean that, you know, if you do want to actually progress in quantum simulation, we have to do it on quantum computers? Uh, uh, so if we want to go big, yes, 
right? But even in classical computers, we can use, we can solve some quantum equations that can already give some ideas. For example, I talked about this cryptochrome protein. This cryptochrome protein has, I don't know how many atoms, right? And it turns out that if you, if you take three atoms, you can have a representative uh, zero order simulation of what's going on. And this is sort of what we can do in our lab. Then there's like our theorist friends that can simulate 21 atoms in the, in the cryptochrome molecule, right? In, in his classical computer. And those give even better predictions than ours. But yeah, at some point, I think what I think that what's going to happen is that people are going to start using quantum computers to map different atoms and different spins like for a whole molecule or something. But but even that is still in its infancy. Yeah, it's, it's going really to take far some... away. Uh, uh, Therese, uh, could I interject for a second, if you don't mind? Sure, sure. Who, who's that? Farham, yes. Yeah, so uh, Tareen, uh, I'd just like to, so I'm uh, I'm doing actually some of the theory um, behind some of this, and I'd like to interject to kind of answer your question in a different way. Go for um, it. Yes. There, uh, your, your question Farham about, is the one doing 21 spins. Go for it. Uh, yeah, my supervisor is the one doing 21 spins. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, uh, so Tareen, uh, there's a thing in physics, which um, I guess it's not that well, um, uh, so in the last 20 or 30 years, the way we have done physics has kind of changed in the sense that there's this new uh, direction called um, emergentists, right? So the idea of emergentists uh, are basically, it's, uh, you, you can think about it philosophically. The, the practical way of thinking about it is the physics at different scales is just different. You know, so it's like the physics at say the nuclear scale is not enough to describe the physics at something smaller, but the vice versa is also true in the sense that the physics to describe things at that atomic scale uh, is, should, can't be the same as anything smaller, right? So it's not about a top uh, bottoms up approach anymore or a top, a top down approach. It's, it's basically, we have to adapt approaches to our scale, right? So when you talk about mm -hmm. simulating biological systems, of course, if you want to simulate bio, biological uh, phenomena at the quantum level, we cannot do that without a quantum computer. That's 100% true. But of course, uh, you have to realize that uh, most biological phenomena are not quantum, right? That's just the way the world is. Uh, and uh, in th those cases, actually, uh, I, I would argue that quantum computing would not only give a, not give an advantage, but probably would give a disadvantage because um, essentially one thing which we have to realize is we have to try to uh, do the best with, we have to try to use quantum computers to solve quantum problems, right? Um, mm. Of course, you can do class, you can, speed up classical things, but really I think the direction is, is the physics is just different, right? And I don't think it's useful to do classical physics what, because a lot of these things in bio, biology, stuff I don't work on. So I only work on quantum physics, right? But there's a lot of stuff that people in my building, I, I work in Living Systems Institute, right? So there are lots of theorists and mathematicians, but biophysicists who work on a lot of biological phenomena, the physics of biological phenomena, purely classically, just because those phenomena are purely classical, right? And so you have to be careful about that. Like, so you have to uh, kind of be aware of the boundary between uh, what you're applying to what. So, um, Faram and, and Tareen, the, the discussion is is awesome. But I want to get to to the question of Jay Aaron, who's in middle school, yeah. and I think he <laughs> should have priority over our discussion. Jay Aaron. No problem. No problem. I get it. So, so, so Thank I you, though. I appreciate it. So, so is this like technology also used to like, um, is 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 it being tested on COVID nineteen? Like, um, so, so you're uh, saying uh, that kind of jumps directly into what I was saying. Well, it wasn't. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. Before that, you know, um, as as I was saying that the COVID nineteen, uh, there is no reason to believe that COVID nineteen is you know, behaves quantumly, right? Because COVID-19 is a pretty macroscopic phenomena. Of course, you know, like I find quantum mechanics everywhere. So I might force it to become quantum, you know, if I'm writing an algorithm up or something. But yeah, the idea is, um, uh, well, uh, 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 these things will really be useful for dealing things, dealing with actual phenomena at the quantum scale. So COVID-19, I, I just don't know, like maybe Clarice, you can add to that. <laughs> well, has it been like tested in like UCLA? 
what uh, uh, in relationship to COVID? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah COVID, like trying to like alter COVID nineteen, being like testing uh, in UCLA. What about COVID nineteen? So I, I am not aware of of anyone uh, proposing any quantum mechanism in COVID nineteen. So uh, yes, and I think it it it. It has to do with Farron's and Torin's discussion, right? Everything at the end is quantum because everything is made of atoms, right? But this does not mean that we need to describe everything quantum mechanically. And uh, the type of quantum phenomena that, that we think, that, that, that we study in particular, is like above like everything just being quantum because they're made of atoms. They have to do, in particular, with again it's it's a bit of a of a jargon it has to do with coherence and in particular with coherent spin superpositions that you might or might not have heard about right so um, in order for something to act as a quantum sensor for example uh, it needs to to have like a coherence time that is long enough for you to be able to sense what it is that you want to sense. So this is like, it's, you can think about, it's like quantum 1.0, everything being made of atoms and coherence is like quantum 2.0. And then there's might be quantum 3.0, which is which is like entanglement, but we're not going to talk about that. In, 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 uh, you don't need entanglement per se to have a quantum sensor. Okay. Okay, thank you. Let me just finish uh, super quickly talking about interdisciplinarity. I really think that interdisciplinarity is where the world is going. And I hope uh, you all get curious and you all not only pursue like very tiny interests, but I, I challenge you to broaden your interests because things are, are starting to, to become more and more overlapping. And this is super, exciting. So uh, again, uh, this is the wonderful people that make this happen. And they're super brave and uh, going into a different field in a, in a new lab during a pandemic. So I have to be thankful to all of those people. And if you're interested uh, in the research, talk to us. And I always finish my, my talks by saying, may the quantum be with you. Uh, Daniel used to say that as well, Daniel Bogart. So I don't know if you know him. No, no, really? Yeah, he used to say that a lot. Be, made a point to be with you. Yeah. No, I thought it was, you know, it, it, I, 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 now I'm sad because I, uh, I thought, Dan it, Daniel, I thought uh, Daniel, it was original. Huh? So Daniel is one of the big people in quantum control. Uh, I know, for, I know, I, I know Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Yeah, uh, kind of. But yeah, he used to say that, may the quantum be with you. Or, and another one he had was uh, stay quantum. You know, like. Oh, that I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Thank you so much. The talk was actually really insightful. That you guys liked. It, it's, it, it is a super cool thing and people and resources should be directed to this. <laughs> Um. Thank you for talking about this. Um. But well, 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 okay. We wish that this would be taught in school, but sadly, no. What's that? So, 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 so okay. Wish that this like topic would be taught in school. Oh, you're almost yeah. there. You're almost there. It will definitely. You can definitely learn this in high school and and university. And I hope you continue interested. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and also thank you for like talking, uh, like, talking about like, um, to talking about like um quantum sensors and like about ab ab about like how like how like, quantum biology like affects the evolution of animals, of like organisms. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but. I'm really sorry if there are any further questions too, but we do have to end our workshop here. So of course, if you do want to refer back to our workshop again in the future, or if you want to like show it to your friends sometime in the future, 
I do believe we post our recordings of our workshop to the community YouTube channel. And it will also have um, Professor ILO's contact information on there too. And to keep this short, this was an amazing and incredible workshop. And again, I think we should all thank Professor Aiello for this amazing and extremely informative talk. And I also want to thank everyone who attended. It was great seeing everyone super engaged during the talk and asking so many questions. And one last reminder before we end this workshop. So if you're interested in learning more about quantum and quantum computing, we also have a quantum 101 course that we are starting in like January. So you can sign up for that at our community website. So does anyone add? want to add any like last minute thoughts? Thank, Thank you. Thank you for sharing it in LinkedIn. That was useful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Nice meeting you all. <laughs>